Hi guys, here we are again. And we made it to the middle of September here in the hellhole of South Austin, Texas. So we have where it is, maybe it won't get to 100 degrees today. Maybe it'll top out at uh, brisk 97 here on Sunday, September 15th, 2013. Sunday morning, and I'm glad to report I have finagled my way around the little cops at the Austin City Library who have uh, suspended my library privileges, gotten around it so I can get back to my job, my Sunday morning job of being a doomsday prophet here from this is the shady doomsday rock because my big doomsday rock would kill me uh, if I went out there in this blistering hot sun. So I'm, I'm going to get around. I'm going to do my reading today. I'll be from Garrett Hardin's The Ostrich Factor. So if you just want to if you just want to fast forward, I'll get around to this in a minute, but I just wanted to, to do a, a, a continuing rant that I started yesterday about all of these aspiring doomsday prophets and environmental alarmists complaining to me like, Hambone, your rants are just too long. You, you, you know, I, 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 I want to listen to what you have to say, but you're, you're, you just don't get to the point. What they want, like everybody else in the world, is, is for Hamlin Little Tail or Garrett Harden or Bill McKibben or whoever else uh, here. They want their, their, their doomsday prophecy and their environmental alarmism packed into these, into these entertaining little two-minute sound bites so they can uh, go listen to uh, someone yakking about the imminent destruction of life on Earth. So they can listen to that for two minutes and then they can click on to I, 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 I don't know what people click on to. Guys, I, I, I hate to break the bad news to you. It takes a little bit of work if you are truly interested uh, and what is going on on this planet, you are going to have to do some work. You are going to have to do some work in both the mainstream and alternative media uh, on the computer. I start every day with my cup of coffee reviewing the mainstream media for better or worse. It is e even for the, the few people on the planet who tend to the media at all, for better or worse, it's what we've got. So, I, and I don't discount them, but I spend much more of my time on the alternative media for a truer picture, and then behind that are these bigger volumes. I spend, my guess is that I spend about eight to 10 hours a day researching this stuff the 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 few friends in, in my quote real life that even have any clue what I do with my life any clue what I do with my life since I stopped being a head up my ass one hundred thousand dollar a year real estate agent going on five years ago I, 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 don't, I don't know what people think who uh, who just stumble across me and, and other people like me, uh, my fellow doomsday prophets. I, I don't know what my friends think. I guess what they think is that uh, I did a, a that I ate some bad mushrooms back in 2008, and that that I just climb up on my rock for these past five years of my doomsday sermons that I'm just pulling this shit out of my ass, that, that, I'm, that, that, that I'm pulling it out of the air, that it's me talking to the mushroom god. Now, I will say, guys, about once a year, I do check in with the, the psilocybin mushroom god or the ayahuasca god or the San Pedro cactus god, and they pretty much do 
do echo everything in these books. But for the other 364 days a year, this dumb hippie on a rock buckles down. And this is, I have put more work into, into putting together this body of knowledge than I did in five years of college. Uh, to arrive at the conclusion that we are screwed as a, a planet. Every one of us. Now, now we, if you're like me, if you're over the age of 50, maybe even over the age of 40, guys, we are, yeah, I'm talking you and I, and perhaps this is a naive prediction, you and I, we're going to get out of this mess. The, the screen door is barely going to hit us on the ass on the way out. But, uh, but if you're under 40, I, I got nothing but pity for you, dude. And, 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 and if you have made the horrendous decision in your life to have children, and they've made the horrendous decision in their lives to have children, I, 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 again, I have nothing but pity for you. The number one best decision I ever made since the day I was born uh, almost 54 years ago was to not have children. My God, what I would sound like if I had children and grandchildren. Thank God uh, I'm getting me and my gene pool out of here with the, green, with the screen door slapping me on the ass. So anyway, guys, it takes some damn work. And this is just the, this is just the latest. My God, look at this. So I'm gonna, I have a whole pile of, uh, of doomsday Bibles of the apocalypse that I will be sharing with you over the next few weeks. I'm gonna read just the opening introduction to the ostrich factor here in a minute before i get to to the ostrich factor, that's just i i haven't even opened these yet i just want to I, I just want to touch on the library of a of a doomsday prophet an environmental alarmist uh here we go a fellow i've never heard bef uh, before named joel e cohen his tome how many people can the earth support? And, I, and my hero, Edward O. Wilson, uh, says about this book, count this the definitive work on the global population problem. Cohen, one of the foremost theoretical biologists in the world, has brought extraordinary analytic powers in humanitarian learnings to the topic, and those who care about the human future will do well to read his conclusions. And my God, guys, look, this is 500 thick, dense pages. I mean, just thumbing through these charts and these graphs and these thick blocks of type. My God, who is going to do this? Who's going to read this? Uh, my eyes are, are rolling back in my head just, just picking up the book. So let's just see uh, how many people can they or support. I'm going to have to put on my old man glasses because uh, this old Noomsday prophet can't read this, uh, this tiny print in this book. Okay, this is just the jacket. Past, uh, how many people can the earth support? Past attempts to answer this question have ranged widely from less than one billion uh, to more than a trillion, and that would be uh, Alex Jones, who claims the Earth can support one quadrillion. So this is one sign that there is no single right answer to the question, how many uh, people can the Earth support? Uh, more than half of the estimates, however, fall within a much narrower range between 4 billion and 16 billion. 
And so uh, this book, as you will find out here with this sentence, in any case, with the world population now at 5.7 billion, so this, this book was written about 10 years ago uh, when there were only 5.7 billion people on this planet, um, we have, it, it, at 5.7 billion people, we have clearly entered a zone where limits on the human carrying capacity of the earth have been anticipated and may well be encountered. So in this penetrating analysis of one of the most crucial questions of our time, a leading scholar in the field reviews the history of world population growth and gives a refreshingly frank <coughs> appraisal of what little can be known about its future. Uh, so this book shows that the apparently simple question posed by its title is incomplete. Uh, and then of course that number all depends on all the other numbers. You know, and so anyway, good God, this thing feels like it weighs about 10 pounds. But I'll be back at you in the next few weeks. Okay, from there, let's, this, this one goes, I, I, you know, it goes right to the, uh, to the point here. The end of the world. The end of the world. The science and ethics of human extinction by a fellow named uh, John Leslie, uh, who is actually uh, a philosopher. So he is, he is looking at the philosophical implications of the impending extinction of the human race. Uh, not so much just all the, all the science and, and the charts and the graphs uh, of what all of these uh, ecologists are saying, talking about overpopulation. When you dig, when you dig down to the bottom of it all, it's overpopulation. Uh, Leslie is professor of philosophy at the University of Guelph. What uh, what all that is? So uh, this is going. Uh, here's one. Uh, uh, I like the chapter four. Why prolong human history? Really? Uh, this looks at, uh, at any ethical need to even keep the human race in existence. I've commented on this, what, what the philosophers uh, in every other species on this planet, from, uh, good God, from gorillas to... Uh, to uh, probably snapping turtles in this creek, what their philosophers are saying about the the need to uh, uh, anyway. Perhaps I'll make that that my uh, my sermon next week. Just to read in the, this small book flap, the end of the world, nuclear war, holes in the ozone layer. Disease, genetic engineering, asteroids, supernovas, any of these may bring human history to an end. But are we in imminent danger of extinction? John Leslie, philosopher John Leslie, assesses the risks facing the human race and concludes, yes, we probably are in imminent danger of extinction. Leslie pays particular attention to the doomsday argument. This argument arising from the undeniable fact that we are a very young species substantially increases the likelihood of our extinction. We are basically a two-year-old running with scissors. That is the, that, that's one way of describing the human race. We are a, a bunch of head up our ass, 
completely, completely clueless two-year-olds running around with a pair of, uh, of scissors ready to put our collective eyes out. The danger of human extinction is real. It is time to stop belittling the risks as so many politicians, scientists, and philosophers still do. It is time to face the facts, but nobody, including a lot of scientists and, and particularly politicians, want to face this bottom line fact that, that, that the human race is in imminent danger of extinction and it ain't gonna come from a goddamn supernova. It's gonna come from supernova homo sapiens exploding, which is, we are uh, a supernova. The human race is both a two-year-old running with scissors and an exploding supernova rolled into one. We have no chance. And here is one man uh, who I have mentioned many times uh, who understands the, the shape the, uh, this planet is in, and that is my hero, my Humpty Dumpty tribe hero, Bill McKibben, and this slim little volume in the large type with no charts, no graphs. He just spells it out. This should take me about three hours to read. I will definitely be coming at you with this. This is his, one of several of his Bibles of the Apocalypse. He simply titles it, The End of Nature. We have the end of the world. We have the end of nature, which is simply another way of saying the end of the world by Bill McKibben. I uh, will be coming back at you but this week. Uh, I, have, I have only read the first chapter of the first story, and this is by my another one of my Humpty Dumpty tribe heroes who I have mentioned several times, uh, my hero Garrett Hardin. Uh, this is his book, uh, The Ostrich Factor. Our population myopia, that uh, the absolute refusal uh, of everyone, just from just from your average citizen to many uh, to, to, to many scientists, embarrassingly enough, and he's particularly calling out both economists and I'm sure politicians listening to these limitless growth model economists going all the way back there to Adam Smith, uh, the ostrich factor. Uh, the, the best way to not see the elephant in the living room of, of overpopulation is to stick our head in our sands and, or, or just stab our eyes out with the scissors that we're running with. Okay, uh, the ostrich factor, our population myopia. Myopia. Garrett Hardin, one of our leading thinkers on problems of human overpopulation, <clears throat> in this book, assails the recklessness and basic ecological ignorance of economists and others who champion the idea of unbounded growth. <clears throat> Hardin delivers an uncompromising critique of mainstream economic thinking. Science, meaning ecological science, has long understood the limits of our environment, he notes, and yet economists, <coughs> and by turn politicians listening to their horseshit, consistently turn a blind eye to one feature we share with all of our planet's inhabitants, the potential for 
irreversible environmental damage through overcrowding. And as humankind draws ever closer to its goal of conquering our final natural enemy, meaning disease, biological disease, the fallacy of sustainable, unchecked population growth. It, it, it is a, completely, a complete contradiction in terms. It is absurd on the, faith, the, the face of it. Sustainable, unchecked population growth. Uh, becomes more and more dangerous. Moreover, Hardin argues rampant growth will soon force us to face many issues that we will find quite unpalatable. Most notably, that since volunteer population control will not work. Uh, it, 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 it's a joke, guys. This ain't going to happen voluntarily. We're not going to do it. We're not going to save this planet. Our, by voluntarily checking our population, it just ain't going to happen. So we got to think of something else to save this planet. Okay. So what are, what are our choices? We will have to turn to democratic coercion. Don't you love that one? Or mutual coercion mutually agreed upon. Sounds a lot like voluntary. To limit growth. Policies that directly threaten long cherished personal rights, meaning uh, the personal right to breed. Uh, Challenging an array of powerful taboos, Hardin takes aim at sacred cows on both sides of the political fence. What, what are some of these sacred cows? We have affirmative action. We have multiculturalism. We have current immigration policies and the greed and excess of big business and growth intoxicated industrialist. Can you say uh, Atlas shrugged? Hardin's forceful and cogent argument for the union of ecology and economics is a must for anyone concerned with the goal of a bountiful yet sustainable world. Sure to spark controversy, this book underscores the urgency of our situation and reveals practical steps we must take to ensure the long-term survival of humankind. Uh, assuming that, uh, that the long-term of, uh, of humankind is even a philosophy we need to embrace. Maybe we just need to embrace the philosophy. It's time to let ourselves just fade on out. That we ain't going to fade. We're going to go out with a bang, not a whimper. And uh, so I have barely opened the pages of this doomsday Bible of the Apocalypse, The Ostrich Factor, Our Population Myopia, by Garrett Hardin, Chapter 1, The Pursuit of Objectivity. And I am going to spend the next few minutes, for anyone who wants to sit around listening to me, read uh, just a couple, about two pages, about two pages from this uh, Doomsday Bible of the Apocalypse, although I will have more to say in, in coming weeks, I'm sure. <clears throat> okay. Adults who indulge in ostracism or ostracism, burying their heads in the sand about the population uh, crisis on this planet, can be said to be observing a taboo which closes off the search for causes. 
the taboo now laid on the subject of human population growth is far from total. I don't know about that. It's not very far from total, but it does inhibit the search for causes. So here we go. My true hero, Thomas Robert Malthus, brought the subject into the open way back there in 1798, and for a good half century, it was a popular topic of public discussions. Then the dialogue slowly degenerated until during the second half of the 20th century, population or overpopulation was considered a slightly laughable topic among many academics. Was this because human populations were no longer growing? By no means. In Malthus's day, the world's population was about one billion. Now it is nearly six times as great. Now it is over, six, over seven times as great. But the topic is still no longer very popular. Malthus was an economist, but many of today's economists say that there is no such thing as a population problem on this planet. No such thing does not exist. It is a figment uh, uh, those damn doom and gloomers imagination with no evidence to back up their claim that there's an overpopulation problem. I, I will refer these idiots to just, just these books that I haven't even started reading yet. No evidence. Okay, uh, the deniers uh, of overpopulation maintain and guys, don't you, don't you love this argument? Maintain that the more people there are in the world, the more rapidly civilization will advance because there will be more Einsteins and Shakespeare's out there to solve humanity's problems. Now, it is worth pointing out that England today has 13 times as many people as it did in Shakespeare's time, and where... We, we might ask, are the 13 new Shakespeare's? The world's 6 billion people, now 7.2 billion people, should be more than enough to furnish whatever talents civilization requires. Evidently, it takes more than mere numbers to produce a sufficiency of geniuses. Uh, I, I would say for every genius born on this planet, there are, are about uh, a million and a half clueless morons born to take their place. Okay. Ask yourself this question. What features of your daily life do you expect to be improved by a further increase in population? And whenever you hear these people uh, you know, talking about how great it is about all these little babies being born. Just ask them the question, dude, what features of your daily life do you expect to be improved by further increase in population? He throws out some examples. Will commuting time to work be decreased? Will streets and highways be less crowded? Will the air be cleaner? Will it cost less to get sparkling water to drink? Will vacation spots be easier to get to and less crowded when you get there? Will the extinction of interesting and valuable animals and plants come to an end? Will crime in the streets diminish? Will international conflicts taper off? There seems to be no end to the negative effects that can reasonably be expected from a further increase in population. At the present rate of population growth, it is difficult to be optimistic about the future. Difficult, my ass. It, there is no way for people who pull their head out of their ass with or without the help 
of five grams of psilocybin mushrooms, although I recommend that as an excellent place to start your road to, uh, to reality. Uh, it is difficult to be optimistic about the future. Yeah, yet more than a few academic ostriches, their heads in the sand continue to chant, we see no population problem ahead. Okay, skipping ahead, then I'm going to read uh, this, this one more page. <clears throat> okay. Objectivity is particularly needed when investigators, meaning uh, people looking into the situation of overpopulation, take up the problems associated with the size of human populations. The man from Mars, uh, I mentioned this, uh, it, 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 it's, if you were from another planet looking at what is going on with human numbers, the man from Ar Mars would surely ask, why don't you try to prevent further increases in your population or even try to decrease the present overpopulation by acceptable means. Well, the heart of the difficulty in that lies in the phrase, by acceptable means. If we already knew a means that we could all agree was acceptable, how about birth control? We could install a system of population control right now. Conventional ethical principles often prevent us from even looking at proposals that might do the job. Odd. No one expects the physics of 50 BC to tell us how to launch a spaceship, but apparently many people are sure that the 2,000 year old ethics developed in Near Eastern villages is all we need to solve all the moral problems created by our cleverness in applying the natural sciences to a world community that is now measured in the billions. The rest of this book attempts to achieve an objective man from Mars comparison of these competing ethical assumptions. Okay. Many scholars do now recognize that the disciplines of economics, ecology, and ethics all share a common problem, namely to discriminate among limited, limitless demands in a world of limited resources over and over again. You cannot have unlimited growth on a limited planet. You can't do it. But some contemporary economists reject this generalization because the economics that became orthodox in the two centuries after Adam Smith after Adam Smith built its theories on the unstated belief that limits do not exist. Or if limits, if limits do exist, they must not be allowed to curb growth. Perpetual growth has become a secular religion built on the assumption that growth equals progress. Fortunately, the hybrid discipline of ecological economics has now been born, uh, and limits are incorporated into the very foundation of its revolutionary structure. Much of the old economics is now regarded as myth, but these mythic priests I guess Julian Simon, thank God, at least that idiot is in the ground now. Uh, they still hold on to the high ground, but their days of dominance are surely numbered. My God, I hope so. This is the chipping away at these high priests 
we need more of these high priests like uh, Julian Simon just checking out and traditional ethics also fails to take account of the inescapable limits of the world which is going to be the subject of this book the end of the world okay and then, and then anyway guys uh, well let me just go I just got three more paragraphs the concept of a of a limited environmental carrying capacity which many orthodox economics economists still ridicule plays a central role in ecological thinking the carrying capacity one of the tasks of this book is to show how ethics and economics are transformed by paying attention to the insights of ecology the power figures of any contemporary society meaning the journalists and the politicians see their interests served best by denying the reality of limits I don't know why he's picking on journalists, certainly politicians, thus turning the topic of population into a virtual taboo. Disputes over population started in earnest with Malthus. He was not the first to take population seriously, but partly for accidental reasons, his writings were the first to lead to a sustained, if sometimes underground, discussion of the subject. Malthus never came up with a convincing proposal for avoiding overpopulation, and his many successors have done little better, and he takes his own lumps here, uh, you know, saying that even he has been a victim of these population taboos and but he's pulling off the gloves uh, and the number one uh, population taboo that I am assuming that he's pulling off the gloves about is this horse shit that we're gonna be able to do this voluntarily uh, all you gotta do is go over there to Africa and look at the birth rates guys uh, it is time to figure out how this planet is going to solve the single biggest threat to the humanity and every other species. And that is how we're going to bring our numbers down before uh, the limits to growth bring our numbers down to zero, which uh, as, as I'm uh, agreeing with more and more philosophers bring it down to zero and, and guys if we continue business as usual that is exactly where we're bringing it to and with that i will wrap up uh, this sunday's version of my doomsday sermon from the rock but i am loaded for bear and uh, your old doomsday preacher hambone has many more bibles of the apocalypse for any one of you who understand that you're not going to understand the collapse of a planet in a convenient little entertaining two-minute sound bite, you've come to the wrong place. If that's what you go back to your goddamn MTV videos, if that's what you want, guys, you ain't gonna hear it here. And this is your old preacher saying, "Bye, guys."